Hello everybody and welcome to another one of Iron Shield Financial Planning's Fly on the Wall webinars. My name is Scott Plaskett and I'm a certified financial planner and the senior financial planner and CEO of the fee-based financial planning firm, Iron Shield Financial Planning. If this is your first time tuning into a fly on the wall recording, let me quickly explain to you what this is. You're going to experience what it's like to be a fly on the wall during one of my update calls with a member of our Top Guns network. This network is my personal network of specialists. Every so often I ask a member of my network to touch base with me to bring me up to speed on the latest happenings in their area. And when they call me, I record the call so you can be a fly on the wall for that call. In today's episode, I have an update call with Charles Wilton, a portfolio manager at Raymond James Limited, a Canadian subsidiary of Raymond James Financial. Raymond James is one of the most respected investment management firms in North America. I love speaking directly to portfolio managers about their process. Process is so important to investing, and when I can get a portfolio manager to explain their process in plain English, we all benefit from this wisdom. Now, here's the call. Okay, Charles, are you there? Yes, I'm all right, here. Perfect, perfect. I just wanted to check things here. What I'm going to do, uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to uh, record our call because I find that uh, oftentimes our clients and people who are listening uh, or finding information on the website uh, tend to like these types of calls and you know having an update from you on some information that you have uh, that you want to share with me. Uh, it it just you know makes it uh, it makes it nice for them to be able to listen to and sort of listen in on our conversation. So if you're good with that, uh, we'll uh, we'll get started. Are you you good with that? Yeah, no, I, I, I like to listen to myself that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, listen, I'm really excited about having uh, having the update call with you today because, you know, in the past, we've, we've had a few conversations over the past uh, couple of weeks, and the one thing I find interesting is your ability to sort of talk about your process, the investment discipline that you follow, uh, and put it into some really plain English terms so that you can, you know, you, you've done a good job at educating, uh, you know, a very complex idea uh, which is, you know, the whole idea of investing in a, in a disciplined fashion and portfolio management, but you're able to ex explain things really well. So I'm just hoping we could go through your, you know, your investment discipline process. I mean, as a portfolio manager, there's a certain way you do things. And the way you do things just has always resonated with me as a, as a way that is, it takes the game, so to speak, you know, when people talk about the investment game, it takes the game out of investing and actually brings it back to the fundamentals of, you know, investing isn't a game, it's a discipline. Uh, so I was hoping you could share some of, some of that discipline with me today. Well, it's, uh, it's funny, I've been in the business, uh, business a long time and certainly for a while this business seems way too complicated and with the advent of technology and computers and models and technic, or, uh, uh, technicals and things. This business is way too complicated when it doesn't have to be complicated. So what I try to do is have a conversation with somebody or look at it in a way that is intuitive rather than having to go to Columbia School to, to try and figure it out. And when we look at things intuitively, so what I'm about to say a 12 or 15 year old kid should be able to understand in 15 or 20 minutes and anybody that doesn't have a, doesn't have a business degree and doesn't know the jargon it doesn't matter because it's because it's intuitive. We we understand the models. We understand what's going on. And when we look at this industry, we have basically in our DNA uh, an inability to make money in the investment business. Now, and I say that sort of. You know, I was going to say, what do you mean by that? I mean, in our DNA. So so you're saying that we're we're not wired and wired properly to to make good we decisions. We are hardwired. Yes. Exactly. We are hardwired against making money in the market. And one of the main reasons for that is as we evolved as a species, the, the, you know, the way that we've lasted is to be able to stick together and to be able to have a herd mentality. So, you know, the whole idea of somebody walking through, you know, in millennia ago, walking through a field and they hear a rustle in the grass, you know, one person would hear the rustle, be afraid and run away. Another person would hear the rustle and be interested and go over there. And there's some tiger, some lion there. And then he gets instantly uh, taken out of the gene pool. <laughs> so, you know, you got a bunch of lions around and everybody has a herd mentality. That's the ability for us to evolve as a species. Now, that, that's okay from that point of view. But when you get into the business of trying to make money in the market and in the investment business, it's a, it's a huge detriment. And the reason that it is is because, you know, in, in this business, you need to make, or it helps to make two basic observations. 
And if one knows these two observations, they are ahead by about 90 percentile of anybody in the industry. And uh, the first one is that process, that the process you have and the process that you develop is more important than the result. So in other words, if you were going to run a triathlon, then the process for you to, to finish the triathlon, the process would be really important that you understand what you do it and you do it in the right way so at the end of it you've got a better chance than not of finishing the, the triathlon. The other observation is that emotion is more important than intellect because we as humans make decisions consciously but we only act emotionally and we are emotional beings and this is one of the main problems because it's the 160 IQ guy in the investment business doesn't beat the 130 IQ guy. Who wins is the person that has the mindset. You know, it's, it's interesting you say that. I mean, in the you know, when I bring it back into my business, which is the financial planning side, the comprehensive planning, you're right. I mean, the success begins when you've got a process or a track to run on. And you know, I've said it before that if you you know if you let the your emotions dictate your investment decision making process, you're going to be wrong every time. So it's interesting to hear you, a portfolio manager, actually bring those two, you know, what I share those two uh, sharing, I guess, topics to the actual investment decision making process. So I'm I find that very interesting. This is one of the reasons people over time, time and time again, bear market after bear market after bull market, people still make the same mistakes. And the old adage was that, well, you know, if it's so easy, why wouldn't people uh, make money if they've learned it once? But because we're emotional beings, it's very difficult for us to move past that. Now, it's been my observation over the years, if you look at the people that have, are the most successful in the investment business for the longest period of time, whether it be Buffett and Dodge and Cox and Mason Hawkins and people over the last 40, 50, 60, 80 years, they all have one thing in common. They all are able to and have the skill set to control their emotions from the investment point of view, and they also all have a process that allows them to allocate capital into the businesses they like. They don't necessarily buy the same stocks, but they all have this. They all understand that the difference between the price, the value they get and the price they pay. So it's like any anybody even not in the investment business they understand, here's the price I pay, now what's the value that I get from the price? So if you buy a home, if you buy a cottage, if you buy a boat, then you have to separate those two. Now, for the most part, people don't understand the price they pay and they don't understand the value they get because they don't know what price, because they don't know how to price the value, which when you look at it, you see people's styles. So some people are they say they're growth uh, investors, some people say they're value investors, some people say they're technicians and momentum. But really, if you're, if you're standing back and look at it, 80% 80, 80 people that invest in the market are momentum players. And 90% of the volume is done by high frequency trades. So when you look at the momentum players, this is more of the herd mentality which brings up another observation that there are many reasons why people don't make money in the market, but there are four main reasons. The first one being we like as humans to look at things that are hot, which also creates the momentum. So it's RIM, it's China, it's Nortel, it's Apple. Whatever is hot, people gravitate towards that because it's in the news, it's making money. New buyers are pushing up the price of the stock, but they have no idea what the actual value is that they're getting. The second reason is people, and these are all psychologically based, people have a tendency to stay away from what's boring and also what has blown up or what's in trouble. For example, the real estate market in the U.S. And they don't have the skill set to be able to go and find the nuggets amongst the rubble. The third reason is people psychologically have a tendency to think they know more than they actually do. And there's many, many studies that people think that they're the best drivers, they're the best everything. 
And the fourth reason, and this is the biggie, is that people act on their emotions or they or put another way, their 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 inability to be able to act because they're controlled by their emotions. Which mm-hmm. is one of the reasons that in two thousand and eight when the market's down and the market's dirty, because of people's in it people would rather not be in the market and miss out on an opportunity than have the loss aversion or not be able to sleep at night. Now, every time there's a market crash and there's a market drop, the same kind of psychological uh, behavior happens. Now, it, it can happen in the real estate business or other kinds of businesses, but from the investment business, this is what creates an opportunity or creates uh, a, a massive problem. And so one of the things when you, you know, when the opportunities are presented, because obviously, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that you can only make money if you buy something for less than you sell it for. But mm. that actual, the act of implementing that and recognizing the opportunity and taking advantage of that opportunity, that's a whole different ball game because, you know, you, you mentioned it in, in, in what you just said and that we think we're smarter than we are and we let emotions drive our, our decision-making process. And we don't, I mean, we, I guess the reality is we, we don't know enough to know how to make a good decision as to whether it is an opportunity or not. We just don't, we don't have the skill set, as you say, to, to determine is this good or is it not. And that in itself, I think, would create a lot of fear, which, and I'm, I'm assuming what you just said then is, it would keep us from making the decision to to do to do the right thing and and that in the in what I'm hearing is kind of where I you know where you come in where you know as a as like a financial advocate or as a, a partner or in assisting and making the right decisions if you've got the track to run on it's nice to know that you know there's somebody there that has the discipline that you can turn to and say hey you know I kind of like this can we just run this through the the filter so to speak and let's determine together if it makes sense or not is that a fair statement Oh, uh, exactly. It's like you know, everything is a is a contradiction in in the investment business. It's like golf. You hit down on the ball for the ball to go up. Yeah. <laughs> you swing you swing slower to hit the ball farther. All these things, golfers, you can't even understand it. They're trying to lift the ball up. They're trying to swing as hard as they can. The ball goes half the length. It's contradictions. And uh, we as humans, because we we evolved in patterns, our brains work that way, that it is very, humans make poor decisions in negative environments. But we're supposed to do that because that's part of our DNA. In other words, when you get fearful or when you, there's doubt, you run and you hide and you do nothing. So first, do no harm. What people have taken advantage of, whether it be Buffett and Benjamin Graham and people that really uh, started a process to be able to understand the difference between price and value, understood this. So what we need to do is we need some process that enables us to control our emotions and to take advantage of what the consensus is in the marketplace. So in other words, you buy when people are fearful and you're fearful when people, you buy on fear and you sell on greed. But that's still, a, that's still you know, the opposite of the way people operate. And you really couldn't do that unless you had some kind of framework or some kind of process. Right. So... If you looked at somebody, if you take any one of your clients or anybody, that, especially people that know nothing about investing in the market, and you took them and you sat down in a boardroom, you sat down for a while and you said, okay, what's going to happen is we're going to make one, you're going to buy one company in North America, and it doesn't matter what company it is, but you've only got one investment and you're going to make that investment in North America, and the future of your child's your child's future is going to depend on the decision that you make. So then all of a sudden they'd say, whoa, wait a minute, that's really important and that's huge and I, I wouldn't even know how to start that. But they would agree that, don't you think that if you made any investment at all, it would have the import and the power of that? In other words, you, unless you're really committed and you understand what you're doing, you're not going to make an investment. So they'd say, well, how will we do that? And I'd say, well, what we could do is bring people into the office to help you. So anybody out there, if you did some due diligence and you understood who are really good in our business and famous, and Buffett always comes to name because people know Buffett or Jack Welch or a lot of really successful people. And we brought three or four of those people. We sat in a room, and we're going to we're going to pick a we're going to pick a, a a company for you to invest in, with the caveat 
that one of the most important decisions you will ever make. And we're going to sit here for one or two days or three days, it doesn't matter, until you understand it with the idea that there's no jargon and you also don't know anything about business. So the first thing that we'd want to do, is we'd say, well, if we're going to buy a business and we're going to own a business, we'd like to understand the business. You don't have to be a technician or a technology expert to understand the business. You just need to understand it. So, for example, a Walmart or a, a bank or, or something, a Home Depot, something that you could really understand. So this is part of the process. In other words, we got, we got some money. We want to buy a business. Now, out of... 18,000 businesses, what are we trying to do? We're trying to eliminate the probability. We're trying to get eliminate the risk, as much risk uh, possible. We're trying to get the odds of making money in this investment on our side and not the other side. So we really have to start with a premise that we understand what we're doing mm-hmm. and we have to understand the business. Okay. So once we understand the business, that in itself <clears throat> eliminates about 95 or 98% of the companies. Now, when you're saying understand the business, are you talking like to what to what level? Is it a very granular level, or just understanding? Well, you understand how they make money. Okay. So you understand how they make money. So Walmart is a retailer. You go in there, you buy it, you look for deals there. They buy from China. You understand how the business works. Okay. You don't understand how Rim works, and you really don't understand how Chevron works and other kinds of businesses. But you understand the concept of of following the money in the business. Right. Right? Okay. So we understand how they work. I don't I don't mean by going through the balance sheet. I just mean people are very comfortable going to Walmart or Walgreens or some I some area that they use all the time and they understand the business. Now that in itself eliminates a huge part of the business because we don't understand technology, no matter who we are, and we don't understand commodities. So if we're looking for a business that we understand, uh, then we want a company that is predictable. So we like to have a company that, you know, has been growing over the years and we understand how it works and, it's, and, and, it, and it will keep growing. So we need some predictability. That eliminates uh, technology because we can't value the change, and we'll get to in a minute about RIM. We can't value the change in a technology company. You have no idea what Apple's going to be in two years from now. You know, it's interesting what you're saying here because I remember watching a, a show uh, where Warren Buffett and Bill Gates were on a stage and they were, they, were, they were just being interviewed. And I remember Warren Buffett said that he could never invest in Microsoft because he didn't understand the company. Right. So right. If, your child, if your child's got, you know, we're going to buy a company and your child's future is going to be determined by that, how much money would you put into something that you you couldn't even analyze. Yeah, no, that's very true. Well, Interesting. You would. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they're not good businesses, whether it's Intel or, or Cisco. It doesn't mean that they're not good businesses. It just means that I'm in the business of trying to eliminate as much risk as possible so myself and my clients can make money and grow our assets and our retirement over time. So I'm not in the business of risk. I'm in the business of trying to eliminate as much risk and pain as possible. So I'm using the market. I'm using the market for myself. The market's not using me. Mm-hmm. So we eliminate anything to do with. And this is just. Be, this is a. This is a, a concept that inherently people understand. If you're going to have a business, and it's going to be your family business, so we want a business that, like I said, that we understand. Now we don't understand. I don't want to bet any money on commodities because I don't know what oil is going to be or what molybdenum is going to be nine years from now or two years from now, and there's no way to price it against the commodity. And the other thing is if you really, if you want to own a business, we don't want to own anything that is price sensitive. Because if we owned a company that sold plastics, and it was a great business, and then all of a sudden they get based on price, and then all of a sudden somebody came out, our competitor, and sold the plastic cheaper than us, then we're out of business the next day. So we want something a little more than that. So we need to buy. We need to to understand that the company's got some predictability to it, which means that there's some barriers of entry. There's uh, advantage that the company has that it's got bar- It's got barriers to entry. So, for example, you couldn't start another Coke. If you had twenty five billion dollars, 
you couldn't start Coke because the distribution unit in Coke is, is priceless. And if somebody had $100 billion, they wouldn't want to try and replicate Coke anyway. Right. And so you, so you want some moat around it that the drivers of the business have got some competitive advantage. And then you also want to see that the business is profitable. So you want to see a return on your investment. You don't want to see wild swings. So someone said that if you looked at really great businesses, so you want to pay a, you want to pay a fair price for a great business rather than a great price for a fair business. And when we get to the top really wonderful companies, you can't get them for nothing. Now, when we have really serious problems like we've had in the past, then you can get them at really good uh, at really uh, like fire sale prices. But for the most part, you're looking for a great business at a fair price. This is against what the 80% of the momentum players are doing. It's like anything. You, if you want quality around you, you're willing to pay. You're willing to pay a fair price for your kid's tutor, and you're willing to buy a good, co safe car at a fair price for your daughter. So we're looking for quality, and we have to pay for the quality. We're just not going to overpay for it. Okay, good. So we're back in the room, and once we decide okay, here, here are 50 companies or 60 companies on the list that we really like. And we've taken however much time to figure out what these companies are. So now we have to figure out, so that's one half of the equation. The other part is how much do we pay for a business? Now, this is the hard part. The whole idea is to buy a, a really great, profitable, expanding business. This is a simple idea, but it's very complex to execute. Mm-hmm because you need, the, you need the skill set to execute it. So on principle, it sounds really great, and that's why most people say that. I'm a long-term investor. Long-term investing, for the most part, is a justification for mediocrity because what you do is you buy a business that go down, oh, well, I'm a long-term investor. So it's a really great safe point for mediocrity, and another good point, diversification, is another way that people... Uh, justify mediocrity because they're trying to buy so much stuff that they're taking what they're trying to do is they're trying to be market neutral because if they're market neutral and there's not any real big losses then assets have a tendency to stay around but we're not in that game yeah I mean, or they do so, what i call the it's a term that i've used before they diversify their portfolio so there's no hope in any any investment even if it does perform exceedingly well there's really no hope that it's going to do much for the overall portfolio. Well, it can't. And when you understand the industry, the industry, the investment industry is an industry that creates fees. So you've got banks, you've got businesses that uh, are fee-based. So mm -hmm. if I was the owner, if I, was, uh, if I invested in banks that had investment arms and they charged a bunch of fees to their clients, well, that would be important to me because that creates fees and shareholder value. So from that point of view, I'm with it. But from me actually being there and paying the fees, I wouldn't like that because they're not earning above what the market rates are. So you wouldn't see the best pe – so there's certain qualifications of what the best people do, and you don't see them. Warren Buffett, as of today, in his portfolio, has 33 stocks. People that are the most successful – now, some have a bunch, but on average, they would probably have around 30 or maybe even less. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is you're going, you know, if you take two or three really great businesses and say it was a Walmart, Coca-Cola, or Pepsi, or these United Healthcare, these kind of businesses, the systematic risk that you're going to lose all your money is nil because they're not all going to go bankrupt. But for me, if you buy China and you buy ETFs and you buy big cap, small cap, you buy the BRICS, you buy uh, Europe, you buy all kinds of stuff. Everybody feels that they're participating in everything. But in fact, what you're doing is you're displaying total mediocrity. Right. Now to get back to the, okay, so then we picked out, we picked out a bunch of companies that we like and we understand and uh, now we have to figure out what, what price we're going to pay. Now when anybody, if you don't know anything about accounting, People know that when, when a company says they earn, say, 10% a year for the last five years, earnings per share are not facts. They're opinions. They're accounting opinions. So gap accounting was invented and basically works for fixed income, bonds and stuff like that. Gap accounting is very difficult to try to figure out what a, an actual business is worth. 
So what we have to do, because that's the law, is we have to reconcile the gap accounting, which is the balance sheet, the income statement, and all that. All the stuff that says in the annual report, we say that's not true. All that is, in, is, is an opinion. So what we have to do is we have to reconcile the gap accounting with the economics of the business. Now, this is an, this is an important point, because when you look at a research thing and it says it's worth $20 a share, it could be worth negative $10 a share. Because what doesn't happen is, you know, uh, if I put it this way, if, you were gonna, if I was going to buy your business and I had uh, one of the clients in the room said, okay, well, we're going to uh, buy this business from Scott. And I said, Scott, what do you want for the business? Well, we want 10 times revenue or 10 times EBITDA or whatever you want to do. I'd say, well, I just need to know a couple of things. And this is what everybody who shops or goes to Macy's or goes to Walmart, here's what they, they want to understand. They want to understand what they're getting, the price and what they're getting. So if I'm going to buy your business, I would like to know how much money was put in your business since you started. And then I would like to know how much cash did you earn on the money that you invested since the business started. Well, you'd think that those two questions or answers would be pretty easy but you've got to go through 80 or 90 pages of footnotes to try and figure that stuff out. So you couldn't really tell me what that is. So we have to find somebody and we have to do the work uh, that would allow us to know that. Okay, so say you earned 8.5% of cash. So since the business started, I don't care if it's a GE or anything, once the, you earned 8.5% cash on the money invested. Now, in order for us to figure that out, we have to go through all the stuff and all the footnotes and all investments made off the balance sheet and the pension stuff and what about all the stock options and what about lending money to subsidiaries and what about what about the losses that you invested five ten years ago you, we bought a bunch of businesses and we lost money on that we lost here and that's all over what we have to do is we have to add all that stuff back in other words we want to know what the cash return is now once we know what the cash return is which is real then I say, okay, now, in order for me to invest in your business, I can go to the bank and get 5% for doing nothing. So if I can get 5% for doing nothing, then I, I should be able to get more from you. But because you're a predictable, wonderful business, let's say we charge 3.5% fee for the equity for us to invest in your company on top of the risk-free. So that's 5% that I could get at the bank plus 3.5%. So in other words... I'm going to charge you 8.5% because that's what my clients want. So there's a cost of equity. So what I do is we take the 8.5% of what our return should be right off their net profit. Oh, okay. Um, so basically, the eight, it, it, you're, yeah, you're building in that if you just take that right off saying, okay, well, this is what I need anyway. It's just even invest in your company. That's the, that's the bare minimum. It's an opportunity cost. Yeah, it's yeah, an yeah, opportunity yeah. cost. So if I come to you and say, Scott, okay, I'm going to invest in your business. That's really great. Uh, now, why should I invest in your business when I could invest in somebody else's business? So if I'm going to get something, I'm going to get 5%, I need something more from you. Now, if you're buying a technology stock or something, well, 3.5% would be crazy, but there'd be no way of trying to price with the value of the businesses anyway. So what, that's called economic value added. In other words, everything that we do and everything that we have has an opportunity cost. For example... Buffett owns many, many, many businesses, Dairy Queen and Fruit of the Loom and uh, uh, tons of businesses. And any of his CEOs, he said, any of my CEOs can come to me anytime and I'll give them all the money they want, $1 billion, $2 billion, $10 billion for investment. But there's a cost for that, and the cost is 15%. So Buffett's guys don't go to Buffett for any money <laughs> unless, they, unless they are really sure that they can make over 15%. So Buffett says, well, you know, if you can't make 15%, it's not a good idea, and why should I throw away money to you? So, you know, there's cost of doing business. So what we're trying to do is put all businesses on the same playing field. And so that, and, multi that multiple that you're talking about, that would change depending on the, the associated risk with that particular business. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if, you, if a business makes money, uh, if a, so all businesses have a cost to them. 
which is called the cost of capital. Just all businesses have a cost. So if you have a business and you owe money to the bank and you owe money to dividends and you owe money to uh, the bond market or whatever, then interest has to be paid on that on a yearly basis. But also, because the equity's out there, so investors are buying your business, then there's a cost to the equity, which I just said it would say be eight and a half percent. So if a business, if a business didn't owe, have any debt at all, for example, it would still have a cost of capital of eight or eight and a half percent. So when you charge uh, for the opportunity costs, only one-third of all businesses in North America make money. Uh, in other words, I hope I'm not making that too complicated. In other words, if you're going to invest with me, if, you, if I'm going to buy, invest with you, I need a return. Yeah. And I'm going, to charge that retur I'm going to charge that return. Now, if you don't get the return, you're gone. Or what we're doing is we're, we're looking for a business that makes way more than the cost of capital. So, okay, so in so other words, the businesses I invest in have very high returns on capital, which is what we're going for. We're going for really good businesses, and that's one of the determinants of a really good business is how much do you make? In other words, if we own the business, after we pay all our expenses and we pay our investors, how much have we got left over at the end of the year? And then what do we do with the money that's left over at the end of the year that we create more value to? So nobody wants a business, a buy a business, that at the end of the year, they don't have any money left over. So if we're going to have a business, couldn't we have a profitable one? <laughs> okay, so, we're at a, so basically what we're doing now is we're, we're, we're filtering it down. We're, we're, we're getting rid of the companies that shouldn't be part of our selection pool. So we understand the business. We found businesses that sort of have you know, high barriers to entry. We've established what our... I guess the, the return that needs to be made on it, the minimum return that needs to be made for that business just to even be a viable business to look at. And now we're looking at, well, what return over and above so the EVA or the economic value added that it generated. And so now that we've got that, what's our next step? Just, just a, a quick reiteration on that. Uh, the airline industry, since Kitty Hawk, since it was formed, since the first airplane flew, the airline industry has never made a dime. The whole industry has just eaten through shareholder value and lost money since the first plane left, and American Airlines just went bankrupt today. So if you invested in GM or car companies, there are a lot of these companies that, uh, that are just uh, price sensitive. There's, no, there's never been any shareholder value. We're looking for a business that's starting to build up and build up like a Nike or these kind of businesses that create tremendous value and increase the shareholder value because when the shareholder, when the company's worth more money, then that's the whole idea. So we keep the company and then we sell it. We make our capital gain because we can't take cash out of it. Right, right, right. So once we do all the work and then we pick a company, then what we want to do is add, for diversification, we want to add 19 more. Now, I picked 20 businesses because, well, 20 versus 22 versus 19. So there's 20 businesses. Mm -hmm. And they all, they're, all, they're not all the same kind of businesses because you have health care and you have other stuff in there. But they all are the same quality and they have very high returns after the cost of capital. They're very profitable, they're predictable, they're wonderful businesses. So what we do is we buy 20 of those businesses. So any one of those businesses would have met your criteria of, if you only had one business to invest in for the, for the rest of your life, yeah. this, this business would fit that, would, 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 would right. accomplish that, yeah. Now because of the volatility in the market, uh, you get some variations. So, for example, you might buy, when we get into, say, the banking industry in the U.S. or the housing industry in the U.S. or whatever industry has gone through some problems, it creates an opportunity to go through the rubble and find some diamonds. The same as it is if uh, any of your clients want to go down and buy a condo at South Beach in Florida. Well, they're way happier now <laughs> than they were three years ago. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that would, would say, well, why would you go now and invest in Florida? Because it's probably going to go a lot lower, and who knows the company, the thing you're going to buy is a big problem or whatever. So still fear, always fear. 
But when you do your work, you go down there, you pick out the places, you go and you look at it, and you buy it. So when somebody, the person you bought it from, maybe the bank that is foreclosed or the person that you bought it from is very upset, you are very happy. Because one, you have money, now you're going and you're buying, you're buying a, you know, a 60%, 70% discount to what you would have three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the banking industry now, so we look at opportunities. Bank of America... Is tra Bank of America is trading at 30% of its intrinsic value, and it's never, ever traded there. But because of the dearth of the herd instinct and what's going on around the world and because of Europe and because of a lot of other things, housing stocks and bank stocks and other companies are being totally decimated in the marketplace, but not fundamentally. That's what we call mispriced. So how do you establish what the, the minimum price is that you'd be willing, or the maximum price that you'd be willing to pay for something is? Okay, well, how, how, okay so what, if, we got a good, if we got a business, what am I willing to pay for it? Yeah, how do you, how do you get to that number? Because like, obviously if somebody came to you and said, listen, Charles, I wanna, I'm really interested in this, but I don't know enough to do it on my own, so I need your, I need your guidance with this. So I need a partnership. So you partner with them and say, okay, I'll take you through my process. And, you know, we get the process. We understand it. We, the logic, it's rooted in logic. How do you come to the, the final determination of, okay, this price that it is at right now is either above or below what it should be at? How do you know what okay. it should be at? Okay. First of all, intrinsic value is really a moving target. Okay. So when somebody says it's worth $30 a share, well, it's not. It's worth around $30 a share. Okay. That's like everything. This, you know, it's half science and half art. It's not a determinant. So if you went, so I'm going to use this uh, game with you. If I come in to you and I say, Scott, I want to buy your business, and you say to me, well, I made 10% return, I made 10% earnings per share for the last five years, and when we look at discounting the cash flow and earnings for the next five years, we're going to earn 10% there too. So when we add up the 10% compounded over the next five years, we come up with a number. And then when we discount that number back to what you get paid at the bank today, that gives you uh, very basically an idea of what it's worth. Okay. Right? Because if you earn five, if you're in ten percent for the last five years, and you're gonna, and we're gonna say you're gonna ten percent for the next five years, that's gonna give us a place to start. And I want a multiple of that revenue, right? In today's dollar, and I say, well, wait a minute, Scott. What if you don't earn ten percent a year for the next five years? Well, that's how we value businesses. Mistake. So I don't know if you're going to grow 10% for the next 10 years or five years, and I'm not willing to pay that, and Warren Buffett's not willing to pay that. Lots of businesses are and lots of people do, but that's not what we do. So here's what we do. We look at the value of your business in the marketplace. So say the value of your stock in the marketplace now is 50 bucks. Then we look at when we understand what it's trading at the market, then the market has an expectation, which is why, which determines the price. Mm -hmm. So if you bought Apple now, the expectation of Apple being a successful business is really high, so you're going to have to pay 100% premium of the value of Apple now because it's so high. Mm -hmm. Because the mark, you're expecting it to be great because of their products, the same as RIM was. So what we do is we take a look at what the, what the market what the expectation of the marketplace is. And when things are bad, you look for, then the expectation is very low. So the expectation on Bank of America, expectation even on Walmart and a lot of these businesses are very low. They're very low what, just based on the sentiment of the, of the market. Okay. So just based on, people haven't made money in the market in 11 years. So in 2000, the expectation, you would have to pay 50 times earnings for Coke. Now you can pay 11 times earnings for coke. It's the expectation. So when we look at a good business, what we've already done the EVA on our business, right? We looked at what the business makes, the quality of the earnings, the growth and everything. Mm -hmm. But then the market says, because we look at the closing price, that they don't expect that to happen. In fact, they expect that if the business has grown 8% a year for the last 15 years, the price in the market, they're expecting the company not to grow for the next 10 years based on the price. Right, right, right. So I call that mispriced. 
Uh, and then I add one more thing to it. What we do is we, on a monthly basis, and I have services that do this, we understand the core, uh, uh, say if we looked at Nike, the core operational value of Nike. I have a number for that, an economic number. This is what the core operational value of that business is today. Then we take a look at what the market value of the company is by the stock price. So, for example, if Apple was worth $1 million from its core operational value, based on its earnings, its cash flow and everything, it's worth $1 million. When you look at the market price, the market value is $2 million. Mm -hmm. So when you deduct the market value from the core operational value, you get a company that's trading at 100% higher than what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get a company like Bank of America and you look at the operational value, it is a 70% discount to what it's worth. When you look at Coca-Cola, when you look at other businesses, and there are a lot of businesses that even didn't have any trouble in the banking industry, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the market value below the, car, the, the operational value. Mm -hmm. So most of the businesses I'm buying are maybe 10, 15, maybe 20%, or maybe around core operational value. That's you, you have identified a really good business based on its ability to create value in earnings and that kind of stuff, uh, cash after everything that's needed. And we're trying to buy them as close to operational value and as a discount as possible. But in some really good businesses and that, you can't. So I will pay, depending on the business, as much as a 20% premium to its operational value. Some businesses never go down to their operational value. Right. And you look at the history of them over 10, 15, 20 years. In other words, just some businesses just don't trade at huge discounts because of the quality of business. Right. But, but all we're looking at, the so what I'm looking at is what the expectation is, what the market says the expectation is by the price, and then I make a determinant of whether that's reasonable or not reasonable. So when we buy businesses that are predictable, see, I can't make I can't make that call on a tech stock. For example, RIM, RIM at one point was trading at three hundred percent of what the value was. So going back, looking at okay, you're going to invest for your daughter for twenty years down the road. You're going to pay three hundred three hundred percent over the value of something that you can't even value. So it was at one hundred and seventy five dollars. Now it's at 16. Now people think that it's a better buy at 16 than it was 175. The thing is, is that we can't price technological change. So why would we even want to play there? So we don't play there. Right. The right. same as gold. The same as gold or mines. How much of your family's future are you willing to bet on gold? Now you might have an opinion, and you might see. We get back into what we talked about before. People have a tendency to think they know more than they do. Right. 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 But how much gold does Buffett own? But a lot of people will. A lot of people, if it was really important decision, wouldn't do it. But from an emotional point of view, they're all over the place on gold. So what? You you know you dig a hole in the ground, take the gold out. You can't use it for anything. Can't you can't use it for anything. And what you do is you take it and put it in another hole, and then you pay some guy to guard it, and you can't use it. <laughs> What we're trying to do is this. Is, this is why I call it, everybody has this inherent understanding of value. Okay, I like the biz. I like it because I understand it. It's a proven business. And I like the price because we've gone through the numbers and we're not really overpaying for the actual cash that we're getting. So I'm comfortable with that. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the history. I'm comfortable with its ability to be able to to grow organically and to increase the value of the business all the time, and I'm buying at a price that I really like. So if I understand that and say the stock is worth seventy dollars, uh, but it's trading at fifty dollars, so we go into the marketplace. Now there's not a lot of enthusiasm for stock trading at fifty when it's, it's when it's really worth seventy. So there must be some problem with the market or whatever. So we own the the business at fifty. Now, if you, know any, if you don't know anything about investing, if you understand the business, you understand what it was worth, and now we bought it at 50, then it goes to 40. Are we upset? No, because we understand what we've got. We're, we're very comfortable. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we're out in the sh- we're out on the ocean, but we got one hell of a great boat. So we're secure because we understand the process and where we are in the process. Now, if the stocks were 50 and it goes to 40 and you have some extra money, you wouldn't be adverse to add to a good business at 40. The problem is, is if you pay 50 and you double up at 40, but it's worth 10. Right, right, right. Like a technology stock. And, you know, so, you know, I have arguments all the time, but not arguments, but discussions all the time with people that are trying to say to me what a business is worth and what the market is worth and what the market's going to do, and this is why I want to double down. And, for example, with Nortel, Nortel was $128, and the smartest people in the room started doubling down on it at 60, then it went bankrupt. (laughs) Well, yeah, obviously they didn't understand the business. Because there's nobody in the planet that can understand the business. Right, right. Because because technological change, it doesn't mean it's not a good business. It just means, where do you want your money? I do not want my money, even though I've got BlackBerry and I like it. And all, I, my job is to do no harm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we want to buy a business. So when we look at a company like Nike, we look at a business. So of the 20 businesses that we own are an integral, uh, integral uh, opportunity for business, the same as if we had our own business. What do we want? We want a business that when we take all the costs into consideration, we would make way more money, and we would like to have a business that is moving along each year and it's predictable, so we don't have to worry about somebody cutting us off at the knees, and we would like to have a business that we are exporting around the world. Globalization is, is huge now. Mm-hmm. So who would like to have a business that we're sending our product to China and to Europe and all over the place? Quality business and quality exports. We're growing our business. Well, you know, it's interesting because you, you, what you touched on there was a really important point that I, wanna, I just want to swing back to. That, you know, let's say in your example, you, you bought the business at 50 your understanding and your analysis said the business is probably worth around 70 and then it drops down to 40. The reason why people tend to panic and they get emotionally charged at that time is because they don't know. And what you're, you've indicated here is that it's the knowledge that eliminates the fear. And once you've got the knowledge, fear is gone and you can make level-headed logical decisions what's required at that point in time as opposed to making the emotional one so you in the process you've just gone through actually you know you've worked emotion completely out of the process and are left with a logical yes no decision based on what you know i you know what i liken it to is somebody driving down 401 highway at four o'clock in the morning in a rainstorm with no lights on, on the back seat. How much control do you figure you got? Yeah, yeah. You got nothing. Yeah. Uh, the other adage that I would use too that people understand, is say you were going to, uh, you, you were a golfer and you're just starting golf or maybe you might be have 18, 20 handicap, but you're just starting your golfing career and uh, you might even, you might even want to take uh, or we'll use another analogy, your, your 12-year-old, 13-year-old son or daughter is going to take up golf and they really like it because you play a little bit and you don't know whether if they like it, they might wind up going to the States on a scholarship or whatever. So what I do is I arrange my son to play with three people each Saturday. So instead of getting the guys from the club to play and the next door neighbor and his Uncle Harry, what I do is I do a bunch of due diligence and I find the top 60 teachers in North America. Mm -hmm. And what I do is he only plays golf with three of those per week. Now, he can play with his buddies one other day or something. But every every week, he plays with three of the top teachers. Mm -hmm. How great would that be? Yeah, I mean... You're you're building something, and, and now all of a sudden, every time he's out there, he's learning, and he's learning through osmosis. He's learning how to play the game. He's learning how to manage how to manage the game, which is different than just learning from taking lessons. So from my point of view, my clients and the people that deal with me know that everything that we talk about is all based on this. We never have another discussion. So we, we never talk about anything else. We talk about what's the value, what's the price, what's the cash flow, how do we know this, what's the predictability. Now, for doing this as long as I've been doing it, uh, uh, example, in, uh, in 1999, Coke was trading at 
$88. Is Coke a good company? Yes, for all the reasons people understand. But are we going to pay $88 for a great business that's worth 40 right. so We did the numbers. The stock was worth 39 A reasonable price would be $39, not 47 times earnings. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I made a list that put a bunch of really great businesses on my wish list. It took me eight years to buy it, but I bought it at 40. <laughs> right. So there's no sense, uh, there's no sense, well, and another, another thing too. So Walmart in 2000 is trading somewhat around the same price that it is now. Mm -hmm. So people say, well, look at these businesses. They've done nothing for 10 years. They must be crappy businesses. So long-term investing doesn't work. This is what the mantra is. But in fact, when you look at it, the reason Walmart hasn't moved in 10 years for the most part is because it was so totally overvalued in 2000. Right, right, right. So what's happened is the shareholder equity has gone up 400%. In other words, it's, it's four times as valuable and the stock hasn't gone up. But now it's got to the point that over the next year, 10 years, it is so undervalued now. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's like, you know, it's like buying, you know, you live in a house, it's $500,000, and then your next door neighbor comes to you and he bangs in the door and says, you know, i, I got to sell the house, you know, we have to move, maybe you want to buy it for your kid. You say, well, what's it worth? Uh, well, I'll give it to you for a million one. Okay, so you pay a million one for the house, and your house is worth five hundred grand. So, unless you don't care, how long are you going to have to hold that house until you can make a profit? <laughs> <laughs> and 15, you can just overpay. You go to Muskogee, overpay. If right. you go into the market in 2000, you overpay. If you go and buy whatever you want to buy, you're overpaying. So when do we not overpay? When there is a problem or a concern. Now, when we get hammers like 2008, from the way that we look at a point of view, we are the happiest you can't say you, you would be happier paying more for your South Beach cottage or, or, or buying a place in Florida, Phoenix now. You'd be the happiest guy on the planet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but when we're, when we're buying great businesses at really good prices or undervalued, there's got to be a macro problem. Now, from the herd instinct point of view and with your lack of skill set and your lack of experience up to that point, you can't move. Right. Well, and, and willing to buy rim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I and I hear you. I mean, because now people are saying, "Well, well, I'm just, I'm uncomfortable moving into the market when the opportunities are there." And the only reason why they're uncomfortable is because they don't know what a good price for that business really is. And you've just gone through a very disciplined, focused approach to number one, establish what is the business, what is the price the business should be at, and number two, just take a look at whether or not you're above or below that and make a determination as to whether or not you're paying, you're getting good value for the price you're paying. Right. You know, my two boys, my two boys graduated business school. They both got their first jobs, and they both got really great jobs that they wanted and they love. So they're coming to me now, and we're talking, you know, like your kids, you're always mentoring your kids and mm -hmm. talking about it. So he said, well, Dad, I this guy called. He wants to buy this technology company. One of my boys works for Telus in Finance and International, and the other works for Labatt. So, you know, they're saying, well, maybe you should buy Bud or maybe you should get this or buy Telus or whatever. And I, I don't really know what I should do. And I said, well, all you have to ask, all you have to do is ask two questions. And any investment guy or anybody that gives you some advice on anything to do with investing, you just have to ask them two questions, and if you ask them two questions, one, 90% won't know the first question, and the other four, five, or six that own oh, the second question can't answer it. And he says, what's that? So that when they're trying to get you to buy something, say, it sounds interesting. How much is it worth, and how do you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it cuts through. It cuts right through. Well, he's just elimina he's eliminated a tremendous amount of pain. <laughs> For the rest of his life, if he if he just sticks to that, how do you know? Now that means that if somebody does know, he's going to be with somebody who's been doing due diligence, and maybe he should be talking to anyway. Right, right, right. But not his buddies that are buying all kinds of stuff. So when I when I use it, take anybody, and you know a lot of people that I have 
the wives come to Bay Street and they're a little bit intimidated. And I said, don't be intimidated. Hey, well, we don't know about the Marvel. Oh, it's so unbelievable. How do you figure that out? We do the analogy like they're shopping. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you go into Macy's, you go into a place, and you see this great sweater for $465, and you go up to them and you say, I, I don't want to pay $465, I'd rather pay $800. They say, well, you'll pay $800 if you want. And you say, oh, look at the sweater I got for $800. Oh, man, it's really beautiful. I really <laughs> understand it. Because we justify it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then if you go and buy a $465 sweater and it's, a, and it's a $200, what you did is you didn't buy that sweater. You bought some Asian recycled silk and it's worth $40. Right. So h- how do you know that you got a, a good deal on the sweater? And my wife knows nothing about this business, but she's a great shopper. So I talk to her in the way that she shops. So she goes into Winners, and she gets the sweater. She says, a sweater, you know, it's $300. I got it for 125 And I said, yeah, but it's just probably some piece of junk that wasn't worth, wasn't worth that anyway. She said, no, no, this is from Jones, New York, and this is here, and this is there. This went through here. They buy sell-out stock or out stock. It goes in here. I see the label. I know what it is. Then they got 25% off, then they got a 15% off that, and I saw this three weeks ago, so now I got the 250 for, uh, uh, you know, $80. <laughs> and I said, well, are you sure that that's the same sweater that would be in Jones, New York? Well, it's exactly the same sweater, and here's how it works, and here's how it works, and fantastic. She might only get two sweaters or three sweaters every six or seven months. Right. And I said, well, that's what I do. <laughs> I don't want to buy the Asian recycled silk. I want to buy the good stuff. So where where do you get the good stuff? And how yeah. do you know it's the good stuff? Yeah, because you understand so she, it. So we all instinctively know. All we, all I do is guide them. But well, you know, I, it, you know, and all the people that have done anything, there's no originality. All Buffett did was he stood on the shoulders of Benjamin Graham. Right, right, right. All I'm doing is standing on the shoulders of other people. Now, because of the retinue of people that I follow, all the best people, I call it the standard practice of excellence. So I've got a group of maybe 20, 30 people that I read the books, know the stuff, get their mark, do everything with them. I, I'm not with the guys that are doing the other stuff. Mm-hmm. So I've got a very distinct and niche pool of investments in what I do that most people don't have. Now, they could if they want, but they just don't follow that kind of uh, process. Right. Well, yeah, no, no, I was going to say, I mean, for, for clients, for, for people who are really, who really want to know and who want to, they, they want, as I said before or at the beginning of this call, they want a financial advocate. They want somebody who they can partner with and build a relationship with to help them make better decisions. It, it, you know, that's why I'm talking to you today because, you know, your ability to, to have the disciplined approach, explain it simply so that people can understand it and it gets rid of all the white noise that's coming in from the media, from you know all the different sources that, that we get fed the information from the internet, and allows what you did earlier in the call, allows you to cut right through. Two questions, if you can't answer these questions, you obviously don't know what you're talking about. And it's, it, yeah, well, it, it works, you know, it's the logic prevails in these. What uh, I try to do is I try to, use, I, try to use, I try to use my knowledge based on all the mistakes you've made. You know, the idea is that we don't live long enough to, make, to learn from all the mistakes. We've got to learn from other people that have made mistakes before us. So I'm using my experience and all the stuff that I do to help people see past what they know. And what's a big part of it for me, because of the, uh, the relationship that I have with my clients, is once they understand the process, we talk a few times, they, they already under, they like it, they understand it. But what's really important for me is their emotional being. Mm-hmm. So the last, you know, 2008, 2009, you know, I brought some people in. I bring them in usually wounded, <laughs> and they're really upset. And then when we went through that, they said, well, that's okay. I, I, I feel way more confident because I like the companies. I like the businesses. And so it's down. I'm not selling the stock today anyway, so I don't basically care, and I can sleep at night. So. Because my money's in with my client's money. Right. So I buy the same stuff. Everybody buys the same stuff. Uh, having the client emotionally okay is huge for my business because that's where a lot of the juice is, mm-hmm. where you could t- t- talk to the client and say, oh, I don't even care about that. That's fine. Let's, 
go play golf or let's talk about something else. And I don't really have the problems of thinking that I'm going to lose my money and something's going to happen to the kids or whatever. Yeah, so it, it, it there's, sounds like there's just no gambling involved. And there's, that, that's what's so beautiful about, about the process is that there's, it's, it's not a gamble. It's an investment. And it's a logical Well and it's an investment. So if somebody if somebody comes in and they want to be and they want to be in the market for twelve months because they're gonna be doing something and they want to get into a bunch of investments, well, I don't put put anybody in for twelve months because time's a factor as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you can buy a great business and it just goes down. Well it's not it's not anybody's fault it goes down. Mm-hmm. You understand the business. So we need time on our side to be able to allow the system to work. Plus we've got twenty businesses so and and fixed income and that. So from, it's managing managing the assets. So if somebody has a time constraint, then you do things a little bit differently on the conservative side. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is that when they are when they feel good, remember I said before, people make decisions consciously, but they only act emotionally. Mm-hmm. So when they're driving home and the market's in a crap can or whatever, and they say, "I don't care," how great is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, conversely, uh, when the market's going up, and the turnover in my portfolio is very low, about 15%, maybe 20% a year, and that's usually because businesses get taken out. Right. So my last business was Genzyme. It got taken over by a French pharmaceutical company. Yeah, so, so it, left, just, it left your portfolio, not because it was the time to sell, it was because somebody else saw the value and bought it. That's right. Yeah. So when you, when you get big bangers, we get, you get investments that you make a lot of money on. You don't act any anything. You don't act any differently than if it was down ten or fifteen percent after you bought it. That's not what we're dealing with. What we're dealing with is the ability for them to feel that somebody competent, somebody capable, is handling not just their investments, but they're handling their you know they're handling their kids' future. They're ha- you know I don't like to say that tritely, but mm-hmm. a lot of people use that. But you know the adage is if they knew what I knew, they wouldn't be so concerned. Right, so right, right. my job or my relationship is to make them feel what I feel. So if you're happy in the midst of a, of a lousy market or happy in the midst of a good market and you're happy and you feel comfortable and confident, now you can go about other things and not worry about it because you know what it's like worrying about money, <laughs> especially when it's this macro yeah, yeah. every day. It's just killing you in Europe and things. Well, that's super. Well, listen, you know, I, the, I know I wanted to talk about a lot of other things on this call, but I think for, uh, for, for time reasons, it just it means that we've gonna, we're going to have to have a few more calls after this in order to, sure. to dive into things a little bit more because there's some other, other areas that I wanted to get into with you that we can, we can talk about in the future. But I think this is great. I appreciate you sort of running through the, the whole process and the discipline that you follow because as a portfolio manager, I mean, we as investors and, and, and in myself included and my clients, you know, they don't necessarily really get the chance to have the one-on-one conversations, and they, they all have the opportunity to, but it's nice to be able to have the conversation to get, to get right to the, to the essence of the discipline that's being followed uh, for what's considered good investing, and it just shows that there's no gambling, there's no, you know, it's not a game, it's, it's you know, it's a discipline, and as you say, it's... You know, when I, when I spoke to my kid's business class, one of the kids said, well, that doesn't seem as complicated as what we read in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but you know seems, what? Well, I, I mean, if that was on the test, I can understand that. Yeah. I can understand what you pay or how do you do that. Like, that seems fairly logical to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. And, and as you say, it's simple yet very complex at the same time because there's certain things that are very difficult to do, and one of those is keeping the emotions out of the decision-making process. And you know what? And that... that that carries over in all aspects of our life, as yeah. parents, as workers, as uh, aunts and uncles, as well as this. It just it can cost you a lot more in this business. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's great. Well, listen, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene then at another time. We'll carry on this conversation, but I thank you very much for giving me a show today and sort of running through that with me, and I look Very forward good. to the next call. All right. Okay, Scott. Thanks, Charles. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye.
Thank you for listening to today's call. If you require further information or have a question relating to today's call, please go to the comments section in the show notes below. Ask your question or make your comment and we'll respond directly online. If you would like to take advantage of a free, no obligation appointment, please call me at 416-626-6515. Or you can visit us on YouTube by checking out our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Ironshield CFP. Follow me on Twitter twitter.com forward slash iron shield cfp like us on facebook facebook.com forward slash iron shield cfp or 